And here in the state of Utah, there are a number of ministries that read out, reach out to LDS people. Utah Lighthouse Ministry is one of those. They're the original, they're the OG, the original gangster. Uh, uh, and everyone sort of followed in thereafter, including our ministry, which moved into the state in 2006. Um, at that time, there were several street ministries out there of whom I've never really met eye to eye. Um, one was headed by a man named Aaron Shafafalov, and uh, Aaron is a dedicated soul to the cause of Christ. And while he has some pretty harsh things to say about me, uh, personally, Aaron is, Aaron is an Aaron. Aaron is a ardent Trinitarianism and a tri Trinitarian and a Calvinist, and he has a street preacher mentality, so to speak. I know he means well, and, um, and I think he's probably far more devout than I will ever be. So I want to preface my comments about, about Aaron be, uh, with that before we go on. It doesn't mean that his views are, are correct in my estimation. Aaron ardently postulates the importance of being in a local church and submitting to its apparent authority, and that includes its discipline over you uh, for sin in your life. And on a recent exposition on Aaron's website, he wrote the following about Matthew 18, 20, where Jesus says, quote, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. And Aaron asks or says, this might mean the exact opposite of how you've heard it used. This is not about casual ad hoc churches that like vapors, emerge briefly and then disappear. Neither is it about the mere universal church that spans the globe, inclusive of all Christians, expressed in unplanned intersections of believers at a coffee shop. He says the context, 18, uh, 15 through 20, is more serious. I want you to catch the little words. It's more serious. It describes a protocol of increasing escalation of confrontation that eventually arrives, if necessary, at excommunication. He says, let's read it. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be unto you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Truly, Jesus says, I say unto you, whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you, if two or three agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am among you. I want to point out before I go on to say uh, comment on, on Aaron's comments, is notice that Jesus is talking to his apostles. He, Jesus, is talking to his Jewish apostles about going out and sharing. And he tells them, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be uh, loosed on earth. So he's talking to apostles who had authority in that day and age to do what they did. And they had mighty authority as they went and they performed miracles and they did a number of other things. That's the context, is it's talking to apostles. He wasn't giving this to the general church. He wasn't giving it to local pastors. He was giving it to his apostles. So I just want to clarify that before we go on. Aaron now says, it refers to identifiable regular governed gatherings that are organized enough to recognize leadership and implement in a church-wide coordinated way, church discipline. The verse is about Jesus putting his divine stamp of approval as though bodily present on a properly administered act of church discipline. 
Paul uses similar language referring to church discipline, saying, For though be absent in body, I am present in spirit, and, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord, and my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are able to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. He's quoting from 1 Corinthians 5. Now again, he's citing Paul, who's a specially called apostle by Christ who had the authority given him to perform miracles and to do things. And Paul says, whether I am present with you or not, I have already pronounced judgment. And when you are assembled, so he gives them at that time his apostolic authority to make a decision about a brother who was having relations with his father's wife. And that's the context again. An apostle. Aaron is citing what apostles were saying and what, how apostles were being instructed. So Aaron says, it's a kind of thing that would be exercised on anyone who bears the, same, the name of a brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler. So he, what he's doing is he's taking the, these passages and he's saying, if there's somebody in your congregation, because we have an established thing going on here by Jesus and Paul themselves, that if anybody is subject to greed, he says, or sexual immorality or an idolater or reviler or drunkard or swindler, this should be in place. Or someone who, though having called themselves a brother, has via persistent bad behavior or undue absence, undue absence from the group, separated themselves from the local church they were once committed to. Aaron says, so if you're inclined to think that the passage means you don't need a well-regulated church, submission to elders, church discipline, i.e. excommunication, or a regular identifiable gathering, or some semblance of church membership, at least defined as identifiable, mutually affirmed recognition of Christian faith and belonging, then you're taking the text in the exact opposite direction. End quote. This is such a misappropriation of Scripture. He has no right to take this and, and assign it to anybody today. As Jesus was again talking to his apostles, and Paul was an apostle when he gave people that authority. He says, churches are outpost embassies of a kingdom that are marked by authority, governance, corporate unity, and regular gatherings. If you find yourself needing restoration from sin, but refuse the gentle and then increasingly firm pleadings of your local church, you just might find your name announced at the church members' meeting. Okay? So he's increasing the heat here. And if you have refused to attach yourself to a local church, it's as though you've preemptively excommunicated your excommunicated yourself from God's people. Sober up and fear God. That act of discipline, Paul favorably calling it judging and purging in 1 Corinthians 5.13, rightly administered as given as though Jesus sits bodily on his throne at the local church. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am among them. He ends it. Got all that? Now, here's the rub, which many people don't understand, and I repeat it, but it's important. Hear me clearly. Aaron is absolutely right. Dead on. Dead on. If the Bible was written 
for believers today and written for us to follow exactly. And if Jesus did not come back and take his bride from the earth. Okay. In other words, what Aaron is more than most truly dedicated to is taking the New Testament even the very words that Jesus shared with his own Jewish apostles to the Jewish nation then. And he is saying, this is how we govern the church. I'm pulling it straight out of the Bible. All right. And I'm applying it to us now. 